Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name's Nish Nikolic, and my guest today is Associate Professor Natalie Taylor. Natalie is an implementation scientist who works in both a research and consulting capacity to help develop and apply optimal ways for organizations to adopt and roll out evidence-based initiatives into practice with the goal of improving outcomes for patients and healthcare workers. Natalie's work involves collaborating with academic health and nonprofit organizations across New South Wales and internationally. Natalie is pioneering a combination of implementation research with statistical modeling and health economics to test the cost effectiveness of implementation interventions and explore ways to identify the active ingredients behind successful implementations of new treatments, technologies, policies, and guidelines. Natalie develops and delivers behavior change workshops and toolkits for healthcare professionals to facilitate and test the impact of their of the transfer of research evidence into practice. Natalie currently leads a program of work focusing on implementation of genetics, genomics, and cancer care. I really enjoyed speaking to Natalie and appreciating the complexity and importance of implementation scientists and look at and looking at the factors that go behind behavior change, particularly within systems like hospitals, as they're unbelievably complex, complicated, and don't just require practical solutions, but often emotional solutions as well. Hope you enjoy the show. Natalie, a big thank you for coming onto the show today. Thanks for having me, Nash. Look, I'm excited to talk about this this space about you know an implementation scientist, what what it is, what the role is, and obviously your work in particular. I have that interest of the scientific method and and obviously research. I know there's been lots and lots of um, critique out there in the past around uh, the replication crisis, and I've had Alex Holcomb on the on the show, and I'm certainly a bit of a fan of of our uh, Ben. Um, gold acres work as well at least in talking about how we can sometimes have some of these cracks and and you know really looking forward to um, talking about also the method of trying to implement uh, what research says into the real world because uh, that's where you know the rubber hits the road so to speak so uh, thanks for coming on the show and maybe you can start with talking about what is an implementation scientist Yeah, thanks very much. Um, So it can be to some quite a a bit of a nebulous term. Um, You know, implementation seems like an everyday word and then you add science or scientists to it and um, all of a sudden it becomes really serious um, (laughs) and confusing. Um, And we definitely find that with um, some of the stakeholders that we work with um, on a, you know, kind of on an everyday basis. But to me, I like to keep it quite simple, really. Um, I think it has two major components. Um, One is where you are um, using um, and applying different tools and methods to translate a piece of evidence into practice. Um, so that might be a new um, piece of kit um, into the healthcare system or introdu- introducing um, a new treatment or diagnosis method. And then there's implementation research, which um, really looks at um, exploring how implementation happens. So um what's the impact of these tools and methods that we use to translate evidence into practice? Um, Why do these things work um, to change individual behaviours in the system or the system itself? Um, And and at what what cost um, and and in which context? So that research um, is something that given the complexity of systems that we're obviously trying to implement evidence into, um, I'd say really that is the science. Um, There's the the practice and and there's the where you're really trying to understand what are the active ingredients um, of implementation success, um, you know, and why do those ingredients matter? How can we replicate them in other settings and how much is all of that going to cost? Because in the end, 
the point of implementation science is to try and get evidence into practice as efficiently as possible. It's a it's an incredibly complex space to try and introduce something new, whether it's a new protocol, a new treatment, a new language set uh, into an an already existing organism. And, and and I talk about this as friction, you being the word, that that uh, anything that causes a lot of friction, we tend to avoid. And anything that's very easy, we tend to just naturally gravitate to. I'm assuming your work uh, is is continuously looking at the, the the friction points as to you know what's going to make people uh, averse to to change or or you know, a new protocol or treatment method or new language diagnosis um, uh, methodology. Uh, can you talk us through that a little bit? And and am I on the right track as well? I should probably ask. <laughs> Um, friction, yep, definitely a good word um, to use and uh, something that um, can be a bit of a kinder word maybe than <laughs> some of the experiences I've had in the past with, you know, trying to um, introduce change. And I, and I guess um, my job generally, um, as I've gone through the years, is really been around thinking about how to frame um the introduction of something new or, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a need to change within the health system from the outset. And that's really to make sure that those within the system know that we are here to support them. So it's not about you're doing something wrong and um, it needs to be changed. It's more like here is something new um, and we want to help to support you to use this in a way that can optimise its delivery, your healthcare delivery, in the context of everything else that's going on as best as possible. Um, and so I think that, I guess, to, to bring the stakeholders to the fore, for me, that is predominantly the healthcare professionals that, that I work with and, um, and build really good relationships with them from the outset um, is kind of one of the most important things to start this journey um, with is, is to make sure that everybody is involved, understands why we're doing what we're doing um, and that we're here not to assess and judge, but to understand and support that um, introduction of new evidence or, or um, a change that needs to happen sometimes with, with existing evidence um, within the health system. Um, you know, sometimes there are um, policies and procedures that aren't quite going uh, to, as as um, intended um, with with something that it already exists. Um, and so, implementation research or implementation science is almost always it's sorry it's often trying to support um, the improvement of the use of a piece of evidence within the health system that already exists or is actually to introduce something new. Um, so starting with the stakeholders, even just to get on the same page about where, which one of those you, you're trying to achieve is, is a good starting point. Um, and uh, I think really understanding um, their perspectives, where they currently sit, and, and trying to understand the, the, the context of the whole organisation that they're working within, because we really need to make sure that people are ready for that change before we start to introduce it. Yeah. And how, how would you gauge whether the parties involved are ready for that change? I'm, I'm assuming change is often something that has many objections uh, attached to it just because change often does you know e even if it's positive change yeah uh, humans often find it difficult to to make that leap you know and obviously that's where some of that framing might might need to be you know really considered in a mindful way about the language that we're proposing or putting forward etc but what are some of those objections um that you often experience or or that you kind of know is likely to come up when uh, a change so it's two-pronged question one is how do we know when an organization or, or the stakeholders are ready for change 
Um, and secondly, is what are the objections that you're yeah. often experiencing? So, um, I think in a, in a simple form, um, we can use tools that are established through um, health services research and implementation science. Um, and and I, I guess across all the fields of um, change management, um, whether it's health services or not, um, that look at, um, you know, readiness to change. So before you embark on a project, you might use that tool to assess um, an organization's or an individual's readiness for change in relation to a particular um, uh, improvement uh, you're trying to make or innovation that you're trying to introduce. And you might also um, try to understand the extent to which they believe in the capabilities of the innovation mm -hmm. itself that you're trying to introduce. Um, so some of this early work to talk to them about what the improvement or the innovation is, their beliefs, try to understand their beliefs about it um, so that you kind of have a good starting point. Not only is this organisation ready for this change, depending on how big it is, um, and also, you know, do do does the organisation, do the people within it believe that this change is going to result in something better for them, for their, you know, for the their patients um, in a in a healthcare setting that they're, they're, they're caring for? Mm. And then I think some of the objections that we might um, face really then stem from. I guess your, the assessment that you might make of readiness to change or beliefs about the in intervention itself will help you to understand whether um, somebody is simply too overwhelmed. Maybe they've got so many new pieces of in intervention, evidence, um, improvements underway at the moment. So how do they prioritise to focus on this um, and then there needs to be kind of decision making that would follow around is this a priority where does it sit in the list of other priorities that are currently underway in terms of change across this organization um, is this the right time um, and then you know from a, a an intervention or um, a, the the area of improvement that you're trying to make it may be what are the beliefs about their current performance in that space so do they believe that they're already doing really well and nothing needs to nothing needs to change um or um this the introduction of this new um evidence-based intervention do they believe in the evidence do they believe it's going to achieve better things for their the delivery of the service that they're providing and the, and ultimately the the patients that they're trying to treat so it's I guess even with that kind of little mini assessment, there's a lot of complexity in there to try and unpick to, you know, to kind of make sure that your starting point um, and the way that you go in and then start to, you know, introduce the change program or change process is factoring all of these things into account. Um, does, that, does that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I could definitely see the, Belief about whether a new approach and new strategy and methodology or protocol uh, is going to help the service or help the individual being a, a significant one, then obviously trying to unpack that and understand what's mm -hmm. the actual objection, you know, whether it's a, a difference of opinion in the evidence base, whether it's a, an opinion about whether people are going to even follow through with the proposed change and therefore you know it renders it in, ineffective if others are not going to do it um it could be anything there's, there's an absolute plethora of, of of possibilities and as you say you know it could be a time-based problem someone's already overwhelmed they're prioritizing other items you know where's the change coming from is it you know ground roots so to speak from 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 below is it management from above yeah. I can imagine the complexities are are, are, are incredible. And I suppose that's what makes it so exciting is yeah. that it is almost 
you know, looking at a problem in real time. It's kind of like therapy, you know, just in real time trying to problem solve uh, you know, the nature of groups and, and how they adopt um, you know, different uh, positions, you know, particularly individuals, how much weight they might have in, in affecting change um, in, in both directions, I suppose, um, and, and the like. So it's quite quite fascinating. Can you give a, a bit of an example of of the the you know a, a strategy that you've been a part of, um, uh, whether it's successful or not, is probably both are fascinating at least for me. Uh, I yeah. often find things that 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 fail um, or, or don't go as intended more interesting. Um, similarly, there's 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 yeah good lessons to learn from both, I suppose, but. Uh, uh, anything that comes to mind um, in terms of what you've worked on or that that's been particularly interesting? Yeah. Um, so I guess um, to sort of take a bit of a, a step back, um, one thing that might be really helpful for for you and the listeners is is really to understand what the crux of an implementation process tends to look like. Yeah, please. There's, there's, there's different things that you can do at each of these phases. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of how you might operationalize, but essentially you're really looking at, you know, you've got the the innovation or the improvement that you want to make. Um, and as you say, there could be, it could be a top-down directive. It could be a ground up. It could be a policy led ex from, ex you know, external to the hospital. So there are a number of different ways that that might come about. You've got your thing um, and you then would generate a group of stakeholders um a bit of a team within an organization to um i suppose get everybody on board um and have a bit of a a group of people that can drive this change you might have a a lead an implementation lead um but you tend to have um a, a group of people that can help them muster up the energy um, and the enthusiasm and the momentum for this process that you're going to go through. And, and then when you, um, this is the time where you might do some early work around understanding readiness for change or use about the innovation or um, improvement um, area itself. Um, and that can be done, as I said, by things like some questionnaires. It might even be some informal or discussions or formal interviews or focus groups just to really try and understand as early as possible what you know what people's views are um once you get through that sort of initial stage of forming the team and getting some general ideas of um perceptions around the organization what we tend to do is um is work through a bit of a process mapping exercise um and so what this entails is um coming up with a very basic diagram really to show um use as a visual um and for up for, for the team for the implementation team to understand what does current practice look like um what are the key um behaviors um that are, are that are required in um in order to achieve the specific goals of this particular piece of uh practice and if it's an improvement that needs to be made, then what you would be able to do with that is talk to people as part of a, an interview or a focus group, who, those who represent different roles within that process to understand from their perspective, what do you do um, to ensure that this process happens? What's your role in the process? Um, what are the interdependencies? What happens if this doesn't happen? Will the process completely fall down? Um, and if it's an improvement, that's a way that you can start to understand people's challenges around what aspects of that process may um, need some focus, need, need to be the area of improvement. If it's a new intervention that you're trying to introduce, it might be more like, where would this intervention fit within your existing practice? And then as a, as a result of that, what would what would need to change? So you start these early conversations just to try and help people visualize the process as, is, as it's done from their perspective. You can have people across the room having a discussion about that process. So people start to realize who else is involved and might 
even realize there's things that happened that affect their work um, or help their work that they never even knew about. And then what you can also do with that is collect audit data along the side so that you can start to map the quantitative data to the experiences that are being told to you by those that are directly involved. And this can really start to help pinpoint um, specific areas where improvement really is needed. It might align those perceptions yes this is where people said they had some challenges and this is where the data actually points to or it might be completely different because people often understand from their own perspective what this process looks looks like and often think that it's going really well when actually you see that an improvement in a particular area or in the introduction of a new intervention might be the thing that actually helps to tie the whole thing together and and really help to optimize the process in itself so really trying to get people to work through that, matching that with quantitative data. And for us as implementation scientists, what this can also do is give you a baseline result of mm. what practice currently looks like. So you've got something to measure um, the the change or the change by from the from the outset. Moving into um kind of the later stages is where you've kind of got these focus areas for change now, whether it's this improvement, the introduction of the intervention. And this is where you can then start to really hone in with um, implementation frameworks that really start to assess um, the psychosocial and the system level barriers to change. And this is what can lead you to design evidence-based strategies to target those specific barriers that people face. And these strategies, um, depending on the level of evidence of, in the implementation space, um, the strategies that have been shown often to target these specific types of barriers. So if I give you an example, um, if somebody has um, a knowledge type barrier, then quite naturally you would think that some new education or information might be helpful to address that knowledge barrier. If somebody's got more of an emotion related barrier, say, for example, um, a healthcare professional struggles to communicate genetic results back to families um, because they, they're not um, they're not maybe trained um, to do that. And it's something that's all of a sudden come into their remit with the way that genomics is transitioning through the system. And so this emotion related barrier might need a different kind of implementation strategy to that of knowledge. Um, they're going to need perhaps um, to have um, some social support. They might need to um, be introduced to something like anticipated regret. So if you don't communicate this to patients, these are all the things that could happen. And therefore, you might feel as a result of, of not giving this information to the family. So just that's just, I guess, a, a couple of examples of mm. how um, simple or complicated um, or um, uh, complex um, the design of an implementation strategy might need to be in order to address the particular barriers. And this is really important for thinking about whether you want to target your implementation strategy or whether you want to throw the kitchen sink in. So obviously we want to really try and hone in on um, the key things that are preventing these behaviours from happening so that we don't have to spend lots and lots of time developing 50 implementation strategies when only three of them actually really matter and can be the thing that make the change we want to see. And that's how we can make things more efficient. And then obviously moving into, you know, kind of in intervention or implementation strategy, design and implementation. So you want to make sure that throughout this process with your stakeholders, when you when you come up with these strategies that they believe that they're realistic, feasible um, to um, introduce into their system to help the intervention do its thing. Um, and so you really want to make sure, um, as I've said, you know, the stakeholder relationships all the way through are really important. So how you operationalize those strategies is also really important. Um, and then moving into kind of monitoring the impact of those strategies once you've introduced them um, to see whether or not that change um, 
you know, that you've you've kind of tried to elicit through these strategies that's worked. And so that might, that might be something that you do as kind of a, a continuous monitoring. You might introduce these strategies at different points in time so that you can see, um, you know, is the behaviour changing? And if it's, you know, through this practice audits, did it change when we introduced this strategy? Um, did three months later, did anything change as we introduced this strategy? So this is where we can really start to hone in on um, the specific impact of particular strategies. If we start to wrap some formal research around that, so rather than it just being an implementation practice um, exercise in a particular organisation, if we wanted to try and do this in 50 organisations and we um, had a big sample size um, to be able to monitor the impact of these uh, of this process, then we might use different strategies in different organisations. We'll be able to make some really sophisticated comparisons about which strategies have worked for what kinds of barriers um, and really start to understand what can be generalisable um, because it's been um, impactful um, to be able to scale up these um, implementation approaches um, as much as we can. And I guess that really starts to help um, reduce the amount of effort you're doing in single sites to work through this process every single time. Mm. But that was a bit of a long winded, um, I, I guess it's not an example, it's more of an overview. And then what I could what I could do next, depending on whether you think this is what you need, is kind of give you an example of how we've worked through this with a with a few different projects. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 it's a very good overview because it's helpful to try and understand how much work goes on before that implementation stage, you know, starts the 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 the, the sounds to me like the the background work, you know, everything that um uh that the effort comes, you know, well before the ad end result. It, 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 it in going and engaging all the stakeholders, even identifying what the problem is, trying to figure out how you might monitor that or even quantify it, how to measure it. Uh, you know, the understanding the readiness of of you know key stakeholders, organisations. Even trying to put a visual together so you can try and understand. What that what the process looks like at the moment, where the downfalls are, where the strengths are, what are the linchpins in the model that if they didn't occur, the whole thing falls apart. But there's 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 so much in that, and hence why there's there's such a large process, and and, and it sounds like it evolves. It, it, it's a moving organism in and of itself to 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 understand, um, you know, and, and to design something that hopefully is is fruitful. Before we go into an example. How? What are sort of examples of of monitoring or collecting data? And and I ask this because even in a very 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 small um, example of of my own in life of of when I was doing my thesis of of simply trying to add a form that um, you know ACT Health, who's you know Australian Capital Territory Health, a lovely organisation, um, trying to organise for them to complete or at least provide a um, questionnaire to to their um, uh, clients yeah. was extremely difficult you know j just to add one one item um, became very very difficult you know and I went to great lengths of trying to print it all out and I mean as you know you got to do ethics everything has to be written up <laughs> but giving full packages you know and, and making it easy and developing where they can drop those things into and reminders and so on. Uh, yeah, after all of that effort, very little behaviour change occurred. Um, and I get it because of all those reasons that you say, prioritisation, they're already overwhelmed with work. It's just yet another thing that there's probably not much payback for other than, you know, goodwill for a, for a student or something. Um, so how, how do you go about monitoring and, and, and collecting data as you know, part of that scientific method of saying let let's try and actually use um, uh, uh, evidence to inform how the system's going. You know, whether it's improving, where it needs more effort, where we need to go out and bolster our our attention, etc. What are some of the ways in which you you do that? 
So I think there's a couple of things. First, I think um, thinking about your outcomes um, is is one of the things that we do right at the be you know towards the beginning of a project, and this is another thing that can take quite a lot of effort to um, drill down into. Um, really what does implementation success look like and how do we measure it? So with with an innovation or um, a, um, a piece of evidence that's already in a health system and needs some improvement for its um, operationalization, um, really we already know with most implementation work that we're trying to do that the evidence is effective if this evidence is implemented well, it will do the thing that it's supposed to do for patients. So you don't really need to necessarily measure patient outcomes so much because you can kind of make the assumption that because it's effective, if we do the things beforehand to make it work, then um, that will come. So we tend to, um, we do sometimes measure patient outcomes because it's a really nice thing to tie the whole thread. But we will often work back to think about service outcomes and implementation outcomes as things that we'd like to measure to understand the success of our implementation effort. And really, if you don't have successful implementation, your service will not improve in the way that you hope. And that will mean that the links that you hope to make to deliver that service to the patients and achieve those outcomes also won't be successful. So it, the path to successful implementation really starts with implementation outcomes. And those outcomes can look like um, things, you know, simple things like adoption. Um, so, you know, there's ways in which you might look to look at audit practice data and um, measure the adoption of the, the particular behaviour, you know, the, the uptake of the behaviour that you're looking for. Um, and you might do that through audit, you might do it for, through self-report, if you can, if your stakeholders are willing to complete um, measures to, um, quant you know, help you quantify the extent to which they believe they do the behaviour. Um, it might also be something called fidelity. So the extent to which the intervention is being delivered as intended. Um, and so with this, you know, for example, if you had um, nurses trained to uh, deliver five key things, um, but then only two of them were being undertaken, um, then this would be a way to monitor the, the quality of the delivery of your intervention, but also it might help you to understand why it might not have worked. So another really important question that we look to understand in implementation science is, if an intervention has failed, is it because the intervention doesn't work or is it because its implementation wasn't good enough? And to really design research projects around that for us is very, very important because we don't want to, um, you know, um, rubbish an intervention that's you know, could be absolutely amazing if mm. it's really just the 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 transition of it into the into the system that hasn't been good enough. So adoption and fidelity are two really kind of key measures um, that we like to use um, that can really solidify your implementation success. But then you might also have things like um, acceptability of the intervention. Um, you know. Do do people think that it's kind of feasible to be able to use in their particular practice? Is it appropriate? Um, is it fee is it um uh, yeah is it is it feasible to to deliver? And there's different measures that you can use to assess quantitatively um a big group's perspective on whether the whether the intervention is acceptable is appropriate is um is feasible um and that can often be something that you might use earlier in the piece to make sure that you do, you don't want to be going ahead and trying to implement mm. something if all your stakeholders already believe that it's it's not appropriate or feasible so that's that might end that up belief your, system isn't yeah. it yeah that, 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 that's trying to identify and and, and address the objections uh, yeah on. yeah and and if you can measure these things um pre mid post implementation then 
you might find that the work that you've done to um, support implementation actually improves the ratings of acceptability or feasibility. And that's another measure of success then. Um, so, and, and again, obviously, the, the the extent to which something has been adopted, um, you know, pre to post is something that you would, um, you know, be able to measure and, and judge as, a, as a, an impact of your implementation effort. In terms of actually getting these things done, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and actually, you know, just thinking about your integration of one item in a system. Um, one thing that um, I've learned through the work that I've done, um, obviously, in implementation research, when I started out, which was about 13 years ago, um, I was the person, not a clinician, um, never really worked in a hospital before, um, was just using my, um, I guess, kind of uh, theoretical knowledge to begin with to run around these health systems and talk to all these different people and try and understand every context and all the people within it and apply these different methods. What I've found now that is that as a researcher, that can be kind of a difficult and inefficient process because you're always going into different systems, learning about new problems um, and and try and get, get up to baseline with everybody who's already there and has all of this experiential and tacit knowledge to begin with and it's also the networks the you know the the organization of the system to actually kind of infiltrate yourself is it, it's quite an efficient way to do things and so what we've tried to do is think about and you know and I guess thinking about yourself I don't know whether you were in the system for that particular item that you were trying to implement as part of your thesis but it's it's a very difficult thing to um go into an organization where you're not inherently part of it and then start to try and introduce change when there's probably a lot of people who, who know a hell of a lot more about the system and the reasons why they do things. So we've, in our work, have um, developed a training package um, for people from within um, healthcare organizations to um upskill in those phases that I spoke to you about earlier, phases of implementation, provide them with the tools to be able to do that, but also with some ongoing coaching from our team so that all the way through as they kind of hit challenges might be things like, we just don't know how to get this one change to a computer system so that everybody will then do the thing that we're hoping that they will do. They've got that tacit knowledge, the experience, um, of the inner workings of the system to be able to um, find more easily um, ways to navigate um, things like computer systems, um, audit, you know, collect audit data, um, IT, even if it's just, you know, speaking to Bob Depp around the corner who sits in IT and can actually, uh, you know, they've already got these relationships built. So for us, it's, crucial that we have that and it makes things so much more efficient and if we can upskill the people within the system then we're building capacity within the system for health for, for implementation as opposed to always trying to go with go in as an outsider mm. and a really good thing about that approach for, from my perspective maybe I'm a bit biased but is that we can in integrate the research alongside so if we run process evaluations which is essentially just looking at what works why how for who what cost we can do that kind of as a process evaluation on the side like a fly on the wall then all this amazing practical implementation is working within the system through the leads but we as the researchers are able to take that data and further explore what the active ingredients of success are mm. It makes sense to to do it uh, uh, as an outsider. I, I would agree in the same way because, in many ways, as you're going out and and identifying the or or working with the stakeholders and then identifying the the leaders, I suppose the champions, going out and upskilling the champions while supporting them to actually apply it. They're the ones with the weight already in the organization they're also the ones that have skin in the game they're also the ones that that you know will 
be able to, in a nuanced way, understand what the challenges are as to why, uh, as to what the objections are, the barriers, you know, whether they're psychosocial, et cetera, et cetera. Yet they can be supported from the side about saying, you know, have you thought about, you know, this type of friction, the avoidance, you know, is it, is it a practical solution? Is it an emotional problem? You know, where are we at so that not only in this one particular implementation um, uh, 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 that it can be successful, but kind of considering it as a conceptual way of, of, of how do you go out and create change ongoing? You know, it's, it's kind of like trying to teach parents skills rather than going in and just working with their kids. And, and we actually know that the data is very clear um, that, that, uh, for behavioral um, issues in particular, it's much more effective for um, parents of young children to be in therapy, working with a psychologist rather than the the child themselves. Um, so, you know, it sounds to me it's very similar um, yeah. in terms of upskilling because that then, that builds capacity and then belongs to the organization uh, and, and continues on, you know, uh, many yeah. fold throughout that person's career. And hopefully is applied to other implementation challenges throughout the organization. Yeah. And, um, you know, perhaps they are also able to transfer some of their skills onto colleagues as well, so that it's something that, um, you know, is um, a bit more perpetual than than just one project with just one person. The, the other thing that um, is really um, kind of interesting to me and, and something that you picked up on before just about their you know, kind of their experience in the system and and bringing that to the, the the researchers to you know and sort of working in partnership, we can provide them with help around the theoretical side of things, understanding these barriers and designing the strategies. But what we're also able to do is bring this tacit knowledge, these intuitive ideas, and and try to marry that as part of our research with the theory, so that we're always thinking about. No, the science of implementation is definitely not set. It's really evolving. And so trying to bring information from within the system about the um, types of strategies that, that the healthcare professionals might apply without knowledge of any theory, um, you know, as to what is supposed to work, um, they might come up with these amazing ideas that we can then test um, you know, to kind of see, oh, well, when they have this barrier, this is the strategy they came up with themselves. This aligns with this particular area of theory. Um, okay, well, now we know that that works in one setting. We can actually add that to the evidence, to the scientific literature. And that means that somebody else can use this type of strategy mm. to address their own problem. So it does become quite, um, you know, a, a circular way of learning between the research and the practice. Um, particularly with the healthcare professionals um, in the middle. Mm, mm. It's so, so fascinating. Can you provide an example of an organisation that you've worked with and, and you know, some of the uh, challenges, what, what was applied, how it was done, who was involved um, yeah. to try and, I suppose, put it all together. Piece it all them. together. Yeah. <laughs> That easy task, right? Yeah. Um, so one of my one of my first um, jobs uh, within the kind of implementation science space within the national health system in the NHS, and they had something at the time um, called uh, the National Patient Safety Agency, and they released patient safety alerts. And um, these alerts were um released based on um either very severe incidents that had happened in hospital um across the country um uh, that could have led to patient harm or death and if there was enough of these things happening um then the, the agency would come together and release a new alert and give some new guidelines or instructions on what healthcare professionals needed to do so one of these alerts was around the um uh, insertion of nasogastric tubes and it was around making sure that the tube was um, inserted and the position was confirmed um, before feeding began 
And there were two um, kind of key ways that this could be done. The first was to insert the tube and then send the patient for an X-ray. And you would find out that the tube based on the X-ray was in position. Um, and then the other way was to um, suck up some aspirate from the bottom of the tube to see whether or not it had a the pH value would, that would determine that it would be OK to feed. And so we did a lot of work um, with the organisations. There was three in total that were involved in um, receiving support for implementation for this alert. Um, and we did a lot of work to understand what the guidelines said, um, what all of the recommendations were, what the target behaviours for change were, did an audit. And what we found was that um, there was um, a large proportion of um um uh, tubes that were or patients that were being sent for x-ray and um the the kind of issue was that the x-rays were being misinterpreted um and so the they were kind of deeming for the tube to be in the correct position when it wasn't and so on the first kind of glance that was what we thought was the the key um behavior that we needed to ch change train junior doctors in more um in in being able to identify that the tube was in the correct position before feeding when we actually went back and we spoke to people and we understood you know kind of their barriers and we had the audit data and we married everything together what we found was that um nobody was using ph um as which was supposed to be the first line method for checking the tube position and this was something that involved nurses um, uh, being able to do so they were able to suck up the aspirate look at the reading and say yes it's within the threshold this patient's okay for feeding nurses knew that they weren't allowed to um, read the x-ray and determine the position of the tube so they and they were too nervous based on the work that we did to verify that the patient was okay for feeding based on an, uh, an aspirate of pH. So they would always send the patient for an X-ray. Then the junior doctor would need to read the X-ray and determine the position. So the work that we did was really around um, ensuring that nurses had the confidence um, and the skills um, to be able to check the position of the pH, uh, check the position of the tube using the pH of the aspirate and um, determine the position uh, of the tube that was okay for feeding. This meant that junior doc that lots of less patients were sent for x-ray, which actually reduced the time um, that they were waiting to be fed by about four hours. Um, and it also meant that the patients that were receiving an x-ray, although that was the gold standard method, once they left the room, it no longer counted. The patient had been moved. There was all these different issues with um, sending the patient and then bringing them back and all these delays with feeding. We actually saved the NHS um, quite a lot of money in um, moving the, um, the, the, the behaviour across to, the, to, to check in the pH um, of the of the X of the sorry checking the pH of the tube um, and feeding patients without having to move them without having to order an x-ray without having to delay their feeding um, and you know as a result um, all of this work that we did to introduce implementation strategies to address emotion to address social influences and um, to address knowledge and skills as well um, you know made a significant difference to um, the I guess the the, the safety of the practices that were done in those hospitals. That's absolutely incredible. Um, I, I, I can imagine that these type of scenarios are just happening everywhere all the time, uh, not because there's any incompetence, not because that, that these, you know, professionals aren't brilliant and, and, and compassionate and kind and, and very skilled but rather because large organisms have lots of complexity, lots of demands, lots of difficulties, um, and lots of ways that we present. And, and, and uh, sometimes behaviours are just there because they are 
relics of the past, you know, and they just continue to be there and and need another set of eyes to at least ask the question, go, what's that? You know, yeah. uh, why is that being done? You know, yeah. Why are we using, you know, extra swabs there? Or, I mean, it could be anything. It could be the tiniest little thing, but I can imagine the the inefficiencies have to be tremendous just because, and we have to accept there's naturally going to be lots of inefficiencies, but uh, that poses the question of how common is this job uh, being used um, in the real world? Like how, how, how many implementation scientists are there that are looking at this to, to, to get better outcomes, you know, and I would, you know, in my mind, you know, I mean, if we're going to reframe it now, that's a pretty easy sell to <clears throat> any um, government agency or, or, or any large agency of saying, we're going to, we're going to save you money and we're going to get a better product. Um, but you're going to need us here full time. You know, we, we, we have to be here full time, at least for a five year period to look through every nook and cranny of everything, uh, and at the same time, we're scientists, so let's measure what we save and whether we save you more than our cost, you know, and and and, and that this goes into perpetuity because ongoing, you're going to get this every year. You know, if we're not doing all of these extra x-rays, yeah, what does that mean, you know, between now and 50 years' time, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that you can pump back into the system and, and yeah. provide a better, better result? Uh, so it's, it, it's a beautiful example of something so small but immense because it has many um uh value uh, value propositions for whether it's the clients or the patients the nurses the doctors the technicians you know the the amount of data that goes along in recording everything i mean there is so much that goes into it um so the question is how many of you guys are in the system? <laughs> well, I think um, I, I think re- researchers, you know, implementation researchers, the, you know, people like me who are, I guess, do, we do the practice, but we're also doing the research. And and I'm I'm in a university system, so you know that's that's different to kind of being a funded position within an organisation. I think people with the skills, you know, the implementation skills. Um, to do the practice and to do the science um, within an organisation would be a, an extreme benefit. And I also think that even beyond that, thinking about or, or, or wider than that, thinking about, you know, just a simple example of um, the medical uh, benefit scheme and the way in which decisions are made around whether a, a new item number should be added um to uh you know as a service um you know think about um whole be- whole body mri for a particular um genetic condition for example to scan for cancer um if that if that mbs item number is approved based on evidence that it's effective as an intervention and it's cost effective well that's great but then how are people going to know that they need to change and how are they going to be supported to change so that they know that now I have to do an old whole body, body MRI scan in all of these instances? Um, and what are the downstream effects from an implementation perspective on all the different roles that might be involved in that through the system? Mm. How are they going to make sure that they all coordinate the, the service um, from something where they actually usually did um, a simple consultation or there was no screening a- available? So I think having something, having an implementation team at a policy level to help um, drive the planning for the implementation of a new service or piece of technology in the health system and to provide that initial planning and then support so that you can start to more seamlessly introduce these new products and services would be in my opinion a really good use of money <laughs> well it, 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 it like, like anything if you identify something that has great value uh, it's important to put 
resources behind that. And, and if that requires a team that runs a campaign, because it does require a team, it's not, it can't be one person because if it's important, you need redundancy. There has to be a team. You know, if, if one person gets sick and that whole full body MRI scan, you know, then gets thrown in the bin, um, very, very poor because you've got no redundancy. There has to be a team that, you know, is well-trained, obviously has the confidence of, of an organisation, but is is guided by, um, uh, you know, data, metrics, and, and, and looking at what the friction points are across the whole chain. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, we've identified something valuable. It's like, yeah, but now you've potentially created a flood of full body MRIs and we don't have MRIs that are just easily available or trained people to, to do the MRIs um, because the demand's already so high, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it opens up almost a can of worms, but you need a team to, to, to do this, to continually look at efficiencies um, uh, that uh, are guided towards better outcomes, you know, for the, for the hospitals, for patients, for the community, obviously for our tax paying dollars, um, you know, and and it, it it's an easy sell, but it, but it's hard because it's complex. You know, it's not a it's not a simple thing because even something very minor has lots of downstream um, or or requires a lot time. of upstream change. Yeah, it's complex and it takes time. There's not a miracle in six months it's something that you know i think i think it takes on average 17 years for evidence to translate into practice and you know we're trying to get it down to one to two years um so i think um it's it's a really um it's a really hard thing i think for for uh, funders to um buy into because there's not an immediate um payback (laughs) Yeah, and people's tenure is not usually that that yeah. to go out <laughs> yeah. and say, um, you know, I'm going to champion this. But this is this is that's the point of having a team, that the team can exist irrespective of the change in in yeah. ownership and, and, and continue, the like. Yeah, and continue to learn, you know, from the previous experience and like we said before, you know, just so that it advance continues to advance the science of implementation, which will feed into the next implementation effort. Yeah. Natalie, I'm mindful of time. Where can people find out more about this type of work? If there are maybe even people who are interested, how do they get involved in in whether from a university level or on the ground? Any good books, yeah. articles, research that that you could point to? Um, so there's, I mean, there's some nice books, uh, dissemination, dissemination and implementation. Um, I, I'm never going to remember all the authors of things, but um, the, that, that's a really good one. A quick um, Google search will help, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and then um, I guess there's works by Jeremy Grimshaw. He's um, kind of the godfather of implementation science, really. So anything that, that he does, um, if people are interested in um, understanding um, how to do implementation research and do it well, Um, And then I guess with my own work, you know, I've been sort of really interested in uh, the training side, you know, of the healthcare professionals in the system, thinking about how we provide this ongoing coaching. And then also just thinking about that intuitive um, and tacit knowledge that the healthcare professionals have to uh, bring to the table um, and be treated just as equally, if not more importantly, than the theory itself. Um, That's, you know, that's kind of my passion area at the moment and a a bit of an agenda that I, you know, I'm trying to work up. So my Google Scholar, you know, my University of New South Wales profile, um, you know, you can find anything about what I do um, in those two spots. It almost does, I think, lend itself out in terms of what's the the largest impact of training the professionals you know, like like uh if i can kind of take a step back there is great value in obviously helping out individual um you know strategies and implementations that have have great value and effort but to lose the opportunity of then teaching the skills to the clinicians uh, or or um 
administrators of of, of these organisations would be um, disappointing if that opportunity is there. And it's it, it, it's kind of like the the parenting approach uh, is 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 yeah. so useful. Um, you know, teaching teaching parents um, rather than working with kids and and uh, the effect across the board or for example working with you know teachers um rather than just the students you can do it one-on-one yeah. but yeah you know, or, or having something that, that 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 that's more sophisticated and, and and larger but uh look very very exciting this is this is part of the way that i like to think not not necessarily get it right but my mind is certainly in 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 that approach there's a whole lot of things that we do here in the in in the practice that you know, for me, I keep looking at how do we reduce clicks, you know, so so minimizing any additional click on the computer, just because one click times, you know, 20 clinicians times a year is too many clicks. Um, if you can <laughs> move a single click, it's a huge difference, huge difference. And, and, and if you're thinking about it all the time, where you're setting up systems to reduce clicks, um, is an improvement and, yeah. and and likewise friction on the other end is important. You know, how do you engage clients? Well, reduce the friction to making them make an appointment or getting them to make an appointment. If you can make it easy, yeah. um, you know, they're they're more likely to engage in that first appointment if they can have the information provided easily. And there's some great intuitive programs out there that do it these days. You know, they the calendar booking systems that, that yeah. you know will do it automatically so someone can do it at midnight and how amazing is that compared to the friction of trying to call in the morning when everyone mm-hmm. else is trying to call um you know hospitals i think will have an opportunity one day to to try and do so also where they can you know use these the, these systems that maybe smaller practices can it's harder to do that on a much larger scale but um yeah, impressive things have, have have come across, and and um, yeah, thank you so much, Natalie, for your for your uh, expertise and and explaining this so so uh, thoroughly and 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 concisely as well. Um, I'm excited to to continue to research this topic because I think there's great value, and um, you know the the changes I think are in such multiples, hence why I you know I feel like we need to have this on the ground in all large organizations, you know, all the time, particularly health, you know, mm-hmm. health is one of those places, health and, and, and education, you know, our primary, that's the bread and butter of society, right? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed indulging in my topic. Um, so th- thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Appreciate it, Ali. Take care. If you enjoyed this podcast, Please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, Come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.